All right, cool. Yeah, so Norman, what I like to do with this is to find out where people began, where their story started, because everybody loves a good origin story. So uh, yeah. so for you, you grew up in Texas, right? I grew up in Texas. I grew up here where I am now in Fort Worth, Texas. And uh, I was uh, going to college at the University of Texas at Arlington, which was quite close by here. Um, I uh, was really kind of unclear about what I wanted to do. I was um, majoring in history at the time. And my mother, one day, I had lunch with my mom, and she was um, uh, trying to be encouraging. And she said, well, if you could do anything you wanted to do, what would you do? And I said, well, I would go to, uh, uh, I would work in movies. And so she <laughs> said, well, you, you should maybe, you should go to film school. And that was something that had never occurred to me before. It was just something that never even crossed my mind. Uh, I um, um, looked into some film schools and decided I wanted to go to USC. And so I applied and got in for the following fall. So I packed up my car and drove to California. Wow. Uh, and back then, there wasn't that many, right? Now there's like a million film well, schools. But you had one were, local, right? There were film schools, there were film programs within schools, sometimes part of the art department or, you know, yeah. so they, so there certainly wasn't the plethora like there is now. But yeah. um, USC was the was the legendary film school. And, yeah, and USC, sister, NYU. Yeah. Those are like my, the sister, my sister is, um, is an actress. And at the time, she was doing a television series in Los Angeles. Um, uh, this would have been 1978, 1979. And so I wasn't going out to LA totally cold. I mean, yeah, she yeah. was out there. And so I, I, I drove out there. In fact, she was living at the legendary hotel, the Chateau Marmont. And she said, well, I'm probably going to get a hotel. I'm probably going to get a house. So I'll just put you up here at the hotel until uh, I do that. And so I was like, okay. So I had my own bungalow at the Chateau Marmont for the for six months I was in uh, film school. <laughs> and um, um, then I realized that she wasn't going to buy a house and she just wasn't going to get around to it. So I moved down to the campus in my second semester at USC. But I went to USA for my remaining two years and got my uh, Bachelor of Arts in uh, Cinema uh, at, at the school there. Uh, and um, then I came back to Texas and I was working in industrial films here in Texas uh, at a at a um, uh, corporation here. And uh, fortunately, my sister's acting career was going gangbusters at the time. And she was in a movie called um, Tender Mercies, which was um, oh, okay. uh, uh, made just about 45 minutes from from my hometown. That was Robert and, uh, Duvall. And, Robert uh, Duvall. Mm -hmm. Yep. And yeah. um, directed by Bruce Beresford. And so I um, was working at this corporation and she happened to hear that the editor, who was an Australian guy named Bill Anderson, who just um, recently passed away, rest in peace, um, he was looking for a local assistant for the time that they were shooting in um, Texas. And so my sister was like, my brother's got out of film school. He could do it. And um, so she called me and told me that I had an appointment with him the next morning. So I went over and met with him and I uh, told him that if I did a good job, that I really wanted him to take me to New York with him. And so he said that he would do that. And he and, and Bruce Beresford, they both, they both took me under their wing and, and taught me a great deal on that very first film. Uh, so I had a very wow. auspicious start to my career. And, uh, and I, I do owe my sister a lot, not just for putting me up at the Chateau Marmont while I was <laughs> studying at USC, but also for, for um, affecting my you know, first job in the, in the um, actual legit motion picture industry. And uh, I'm very grateful to her for that. Um, yeah, was that the one with Lenny Von Van Dolan? And... Yes, uh huh. Lenny, who also passed I, away this year. Yeah, I interviewed yeah. him. Yeah, he was really yeah. cool guy. He, very, the, he loved that film, and he had a cool story. Yeah. Alan Barkin was in it, right? Alan Barkin was in it. Yes, uh -huh. yeah. And um, um, my sister played uh, Duvall's ex-wife. Um, uh, That's awesome. And, um, it was uh, it was a really great opportunity for me because it quickly led to two other films that were both. Uh, shot in Texas and finished in New York. I did. Uh, I followed that film up with uh, being an assistant editor on Silkwood, uh, and then I was an assistant editor on Places in the Heart. So, really quickly, I uh, became like this um, uh, guy who could work in Texas locally, 
and, and knew how to be an, a good assistant editor and then was able to work in the unions in New York. And so I would um, uh, go up to New York after, after the time in Texas and, and finish the films up there. Um, when you're then, at USC, um, did you like, when you're doing the film program, you're doing like everything while you're there. Like what, what drew you to editing? Was it just that well, the job was available what, or? Well, part of what drew, drew me to editing was that USC is a rich kid school. Everybody is very, is usually very wealthy who goes there. <laughs> and I was, I, you know, I'm from a very middle-class background. And so uh, I had to work part-time jobs. Uh, one of which was at the Chateau Marmont on the switchboard at the Chateau Marmont. Really? Uh, yeah. That's awesome. And uh, I worked at the college bookstore, uh, this uh, bookstore down by USC called TAMS. And then I also worked on a research project at the library, cataloging all of these files that uh, USC had inherited from uh, Universal Studios. So I was working three part-time jobs. And so on any given crew, the job that I could do on my own time that didn't require myself to be working in tandem with a crew was editing. I could do that uh, when, I, when I could fit it in. And you know, I, was, I was getting very little sleep. I mean, I look at pictures of myself shortly after I graduated and I look like I'd just come back from the war or something because I, uh, uh, was, was, I looked so tired, these big bags under my eyes and I was really skinny. And um, that, but that was my life. I was working three part-time jobs and then um, um, working on, at, at night and when I could on various projects. Uh, and, you know, within my class of people, I became one of the people who uh, was an editor in my class. And so that was kind of how it happened. It wasn't like some grand plan on my part. In fact, no aspect of my career has been any kind of, um, there's been no no real plan to it as much as <laughs> I just always ended up landing in the right place at the right time and and uh, really seized the opportunity that was in front of me. I, I do feel like that I was ready for all the opportunities that came my way, but I never really decided to go to film school as much as I was just knew I didn't know what I wanted to do with a history degree. And my mother was kind of the one that was like, well, you should go to film school. And that's then, awesome. uh, I didn't really have a plan for where I was going to live. You know, when I got to California, my sister was kind of like, yeah, I'll put you up here at the hotel. And then I didn't really uh, have a plan for well, what, how, what, how I was going to succeed in film school. <laughs> but I just like uh, took to editing like a duck to water and I was good at it. So I, under I understood it intuitively. And I, and I often say to people, people who are trying to plot a career path, I, I say, look, you know, I'm not the guy to talk to if you have real certain career plan you're trying to track. <laughs> I'm the guy to talk to if, if you really want to trust that the life will show you what to do next, because it always has in my case. I never really planned to become a director. I was editing in features and I was really enjoying editing in features. And then I had a producer that wanted me to edit some television pilots and I did, and all of my pilots went to series. And so I, uh, he wanted me to stay on and do a, a series. And I was like, oh boy, I don't really <laughs> want to be editing in television because you're essentially cutting half a feature film every three weeks. And so I was offered the pilot of the OC uh, wow. And they wanted me to stay on the series. And I said, well, I'll stay on the series if you let me direct. And they were like, okay. And I was like, okay, <laughs> I yeah. guess I'm going to direct now. So uh, like, it that, worked. It actually yeah. worked. Well, it was interesting because, I mean, look, I, I think that everything I had been doing was leading up to that. Yeah. I think that I'm just, I'm much more of an intuitive thinker. And uh, I intuitively knew how to edit and I intuitively was moving towards directing the whole time because that's the kind of editor I was. Even even on my very first job, I remember saying to the editor, like, oh, I think it would be better if you did it like this than that. And he was like, <laughs> like, who the fuck are you? You know, like, you're just yeah. this guy I hired off the street in Texas, you know? <laughs> yeah. And uh, I remember one time he, he got really angry at me because I I had a very strong idea of the way a certain sequence of scenes should be constructed. And I told him what I thought. And um, and this was the days where he was working on a moviola and I was standing next to him and handing him handing him trims. And and um, <laughs> I, I said to him, I said, I really think this would be better if this scene was in front of this scene instead of behind the scene. 
And he said, well, I, I don't agree with you. And so that was the end of that discussion. And so then the following day, I went out to pick up lunch and Bruce Beresford, the director, was like, oh, I'll, I'll walk with you, Norman. I'll go with you down to pick up the lunch. And so Bruce and I walked down to the corner. And while we were walking down the corner, I was like, you know, Bruce, I really feel like the the, the sequence of this scene, the, the, the sequence should be this scene and then this other scene, not the way it is currently <laughs> And the cut, and so we got back to the editing room, and Bruce was kind of like, "Norman had a really good idea when we were out at lunch." And oh god, I got in so much trouble. I mean, it's I so fortunate. It's it's so fortunate that I wasn't fired right at that moment, <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, the, my career could have ended right then because um, uh, Bill Anderson, the editor, he's like, "Norman, I need to speak to you out in the hallway, please." And so I, he took me out there and he really read me the riot act. He was like, don't you ever do that again. Don't you ever go around me. Don't try to do an in run out around me. But it wasn't coming from a place of, wasn't coming from a place of me wanting to be right or me wanting, I just genuinely believed, I still believe, you know, I still yeah. believe that the, the sequence of scenes would be better if it was structured slightly differently than it was. But that's, uh, you know, that's just the way that my mind works. And I've always been that way. Uh, and I think that people picked up on that. I mean, I think that people understood that I that I was always looking for um, uh, the the best possible product. You know, I've never been somebody who's who's trying to win a point as much as I've always been just trying to like come at it from this is what I really believe would be the best. And yeah. uh, so that that has served me very well. And and I've always been in the right place at the right time. As I said, people really wanting to see me succeed because they do believe in uh, how hard I work. And so uh, what was like the big, uh, what was the big break? Like, was it a particular movie or TV show like editing wise? Cause obviously you're editing for a while. Cause the credits wise, they're never all on here. But, like the first one that it's just you as editors, like triumph of the spirit, yeah, firebirds or silent night. Yeah. Yeah. Triumph of the spirit was a, was a very uh, um, powerful film. Uh, came a little bit ahead of its time, I think. It was shot in Auschwitz. It was about the Holocaust. Oh, worked wow. with a um, worked with a director called um, a, a named Robert Young, who uh, uh, has been a great mentor to me, and I've done several films with him. Uh, he um, he again. I was editing under the auspices of another editor, and. Um, uh, but Bob was very open to my ideas, and and then I subsequently cut another film, another two films for Bob, and then on a third film, or actually a fourth film, uh, a film that the Criterion Collection was picking up of his, a very early film of his uh, called Alan Brista. Wow. Uh, he um, asked me if I would go back and recut Alan Brista because he believed in my ability, and I'm very grateful that he allowed me to do that and to be part of that process. So I had a, I had a, a, a great um, uh, mentorship. I, you know, also worked with Bob Layton on When Harry Met Sally. He was an editor oh, I worked wow. for. Uh, I worked on on several films as an assistant and really learned from some of these guys who were at the top of their game and at the top of their craft. And then I went through a whole series of films where I was working on, you know, Roger Corman films. Just you know, nice. like, just films that I couldn't even tell you what they were called anymore because I, you know, just went through a whole bunch of them really quickly. But what was great about that was that Roger Corman bought the, uh, um, the Avids before anybody else did. He really saw the, the, read the writing on the wall and understood that you were going to be able to cut faster and cheaper on the Avid than you would be on film. And so uh, the head of post-production at Roger Corman's company called me up and she said, so you know the Avid, right? And I was like, yeah, I know it. And uh, she said, so you've worked on it. And I was like, yeah, mm -hmm, I've worked on it. And uh, <laughs> she said, because we have a film that we want to do and we want you to do it. And I was like, great. And so I, I had never worked on the Avid. I I did a couple <laughs> of tutorials on it, you know, so I had my assistant go in. I said, just go in a week early, get the instruction book and then just sit beside me and tell me what I'm doing. And uh, we cut that film with him sitting right next to me, just telling me how to, <laughs> how to work through the... <laughs> how to work through the uh, um, um, process of uh, working on an Avid. 
Um, so, uh, you know, there was that whole um, aspect of my career. And then what happened in the late 90s, I got on the radar of the Bond companies uh, in a lot of these independent films that were um, having maybe some some hiccup or something that they weren't quite sure with. I was brought in to do some re-editing on some films that then went to film festivals and were <laughs> picked up. And uh, the, wow. the biggest... The biggest one of that being a film called Happy Texas, which was a film that one of my classmates from USC directed. And um, that film. Really? Was, That's cool. Yeah. And that film had another editor and it was not in good shape. And so he asked me if I would come to a screening of it. And I saw it and I, I said, well, I think you need to, to reexamine. You need to reexamine the way it's edited because I said, I feel like the comedy is just not landing. And he said, well, is there any way you could do it? And I said, well, uh, I, I, I don't know, uh, cause I was working on something else at the time, but I said, let me see if I can work it out. So again, I was working in the day on one film and I was re-editing Happy Texas at night. And then, uh, Happy Texas went on to be sold at Sundance for, you know, $10 million, which up Whoa. to that time was the largest, uh, price that had ever been paid for a film at Sundance. And so that was, that gave me a lot of cred yes so going into working on some of these pilots uh and you know i was doing pilots because you know you knock them off in six weeks and then you'd move on <laughs> and so i i was was open to cutting pilots in between other feature films and um um that again my cred went way up at warner brothers and so warner brothers were very supportive of my um, career as an editor and were essentially giving my choice of pilots to cut in any given spring. And that kind of led to my relationship with uh, Stephanie Savage, who works with Josh Schwartz. And she was the one, Stephanie Savage is the one who brought me in to meet, Stephanie Savage and McGee brought me in to meet Josh Schwartz for the OC. And so the OC was really the big turning point in my career because that was the show that I began directing on. And then I, I directed six. I, I, I was editing the first three seasons and directing. And then in the fourth season, I was only directing. And then I, I um, went from that show on to two of their other shows, Chuck and Gossip Girl. And oh, wow. My career kind of, my directing career kind of blossomed out from there. But so I owe those to those three, McGee, Stephanie Savage, and Josh Schwartz. I owe the three of them a great uh, debt because uh, they. Wow believed in me at that point in my career and gave me the directing career I have today, which has been a very satisfying um, uh, last 18, 19 yeah. years. Yeah, yeah so. no, definitely. One question about like editing, obviously like working with different like producers and directors are totally different, but what's like the process? I know with Roger Corman, they probably just said like, Hey, have at it, but what's your process? Like, how does it work? Are you, you're getting the film, like when you were on set, like even for like Tenure Mercies or any other movies, you're cutting daily? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're cutting daily. You start cutting as soon as they start shooting because you want to see if you need extra things and you want to see if you don't need certain things. There's certain things you don't need as you start to put things together. So the editor is working right away from the very beginning. And so very shortly after production's finished, you have an editor's cut and then you sit down with the director and on a television show, you sit down with the, the director gets four days, which is very, very, very quick. But on a movie, <laughs> you, you know, a director's cut is generally about 10 weeks. And the uh, director gets a chance to sit down and shape the film before producers are brought in. And um, on a TV show, as I said, it's four days and then the producers are brought in. But the editor, you know, basically has a, an opportunity to put together a cut that he thinks makes, he or she thinks makes sense. Yeah. Um, I always liked when I was editing, I always liked having a lot of input from the directors. So even when I was editing in television, I would go down on the set and talk to the directors and say, would you have a mind here or ask them if they wanted to look at anything as I went along. There's some uh, editors that don't want to show anything to a director until they feel like they've really polished it and had their way with it. But 
I'm always going to unwind it. I'm always going to like be the guy that comes in and goes like, well, I think there's a better way to do that. Or I think we, sh- <laughs> we, I think we should at least examine some other ways. Um, and so I always tell the uh, editors, you know, look, I'm going to have a lot of notes. It's not personal. And, you know, just know that I'm going to, I'm going to have a lot of questions and a lot of things I want to look at and probably a lot of things I want to change. But um, um, that's, that's part of the process I enjoy is, is the actual examining the, the footage and finding, you know, like um, what are the, what are the potentialities in it that um, maybe the, the editor didn't see the first time through. Nobody, nobody can see everything. And, yeah. uh, you know, I, I, I always have ideas about the way that I think things are going to work. And then I see them and I go like, eh, that didn't work so well, did it? And, you know, I'm always, I'm really, I'm really open to uh, somebody else having a different point of view. It's never been with me, as you can probably tell from the stories I'm telling from the very yeah. beginning. It's never been for me about, oh, I need to be the one who decides. You know, I, I could give a shit about whether it's my idea or somebody else's idea. I just want the damn thing to work. You know, and I want yeah. people to be moved by what they're seeing. And so for me, the most important thing is that, you know, I am working with people who are just playing full out. Um, I get a little irritated sometimes when I work on a television show where I feel like the editor just wants me to pat them on their head and send them on their merry way. I understand that because, you know, they're very busy and it's hard. But, you know, I am always going to come in and want to kind of examine the material and look at what are the other things that you may not see the first time through. Uh, because it is a very intuitive process and you want to, you want to leave the room for discovery. Yeah. No, I was just trying to think because some actors, I don't know if actors ever had any gripes against you, but I helped an actor write, a, write his memoirs, this guy, Larry Hankin. Uh-huh. And he was telling me that he would like do a take on a show, like on a guest spot or something or in a movie. And then he'd see the movie and be like, why'd they use that one? Well, I, I, I did have an experience one time with him. Um, I was working on a movie and um, there was a lovely actress in it uh, who was married to one of the producers and uh, the director um, and I were looking at the film and I said, well, you know, this film would work so much better if we could drop this scene with this, with this actress in it. And he said, well, that's never going to fly, you know, because the producer won't allow that scene to be cut. And I said, well, we really owe it to ourselves to take it out. We really owe it to ourselves to have at least one screening amongst ourselves where we take that scene out because the scene, the, the movie would play so much better without it. It just stops everything cold. And so we did that. We had a screening and, and uh, it was just me, the director and, and the producer and, and, and another producer. It was the four of us. And uh, the lights came up at the end of it and the producer who was married to the actress said, you know, he said, well, you know, the movie was playing so well. I think we should put that scene with my wife back in. And so we did. We put it back in again. But nobody could deny that the movie was better without it. We yeah. all saw it. We all saw it. We all saw the movie. And so after another couple of days, he came back and said, yeah, let's take that scene out. Because, <laughs> um, it, yeah, and you know, look, it's painful. It's painful. There was nothing yeah. wrong with the scene in and of itself. There's nothing wrong with that scene. It was the flow of the material overall that was suffering. Now, uh, Tender Mercies is another example. Tender Mercies was actually finished. We finished the film and it was 20 minutes longer. And there was another 20 minutes of story in there, including several scenes with Ellen Barkin, uh, several scenes with my sister, uh, who played uh, Robert Duvall's ex-wife. And... um, then Universal was very nervous about the film because they felt like it was very slow moving. And so they didn't want to release it unless Bruce cut 20 minutes out of it. And so Bruce went back in and cut 20 minutes out of it just before it was released, including almost all of Ellen Barkin's work. And, you know, it's oh like, my I think, gosh. I think Ellen Barkin was actually in one scene in the final film. And um, um, the scenes that she was in... Um, and the scenes that she was in with my sister, because my sister played her mother, um, they were excellent scenes. But the movie that Universal wanted was not the 20 minute longer version. Now, I personally think the 20 minute longer version would be a better version of that movie because there were major jumps in story that I just felt like weren't 
warranted by the material that was there. But that was what they wanted. And at the end of the day, you know, we work in a in a business in, in yeah. television. I've had a, a producer remind me that we work in an advertising delivery system. You know, that that's that's what we're doing. We're delivering advertising. Yeah. And so, you know, there's there's many things that get sacrificed, both good and bad. I just gave you two examples, one of which I think yeah. the movie was actually better by taking out a scene. Very good scene, beautifully acted, beautifully performed, was stopping the movie cold, you know, and was 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 off story, was off story about what the movie was about. And then another example where I feel like, well, a, the 20 minute longer version of, of Tender Mercies, I would maintain would have been a better film. But, you know, yeah, when I talked to Lenny, Lenny knew her because Lenny was from Texas. And then he mm-hmm. went to New York for Broadway and he knew Ellen. And mm-hmm. he told me like how much she loved that role. She, she like paid a local girl or a local lady to record her lines from the script. So uh-huh. she would be able to nail her Texas accent. accent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but as you know, in the final film, Ellen's in one scene. That's and, yeah. Uh, you know, she probably had seven or eight. So uh, I don't, I don't remember exactly, but there, there were that's crazy s- significantly more scenes. And so you know, that's always heartbreaking. It's always heartbreaking because um, uh, I mean, look, I've had it happen on TV shows where an actor will tell everybody on Instagram, "Watch me, I'm in a show tonight." <laughs> And then their scene is cut out. And so if I know that an actor's scene is going to be cut, I try to let that actor know. I try to let them, I try to let them know that that's coming down the pike because at least then, you know, they can prepare themselves for. Yeah. Larry got cut out of pretty woman. He was the landlord in the opening scene and uh, Gary Marshall never told him. And he like knew Gary Marshall through like working with him over the years. Yeah, well, you know, to play devil's advocate for a moment, you know, th- th- there's yeah. so many things on a director's plate as you're oh, trying I'm to sure. finish a film. You know, yeah. sometimes they're not even thinking about it. But because of the fact that, um, um, you know, I was uh, uh, privy to this up close and because, in fact, my sister lost scenes as well in Tinder Mercy. Yeah. You know, I, I've just always been more sensitive to it than maybe a lot of directors would be. I think that... Uh, the, the bottom line is, you know, all you're doing when you're shooting is you're collecting material that you're going to shape into something. And you never know for sure whether that's going to be working as well as you hope until you get into the editing room. It, you just never know. And um, it, it, as I said, it oftentimes doesn't have anything to do with the quality of performance or doesn't have anything to do with whether the scene itself works but whether the scene works in the in the flow of the of the i you know i was just reading an article with uh, k blanchett about uh, tar um and um there's a very important scene that she felt was really crucial in terms of what her what her um um character's arc through the whole movie is and, and that scene was ultimately cut. And she was talking to Todd Field about it. And he said, well, it's, I think the word she used was it's homopathically there. You know, it's, it's basically, yeah. it's basically building the, the, the context for all those other scenes to be. Now, um, would that have been a, a, a better, worse, different, neutral change? Who knows? You know, I mean, there's, way, there's no way to know. But I have noticed that most of the time when I've seen director's cuts, when I've gone back and look at director's cuts, it's really rare that I look at a director's cut and go like, oh, yeah, that's better. You know, there's a lot of times where I feel like, yeah, well, there was a reason to cut out those scenes. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah. so, and there was a reason. And, and, and not always, not always. I mean, there's, there's times where I really feel like that there's some wonderful um, stuff that, that is restored to a film. But I have seen films where... You know, it's kind of like, oh, the director's cut. And then I look at it and I'm just going, I know. Mm, yeah, you know, that film was doing just fine by itself. It didn't need, <laughs> it didn't need any of that second thinking, you know. It was, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult thing because um, uh, a motion picture is never completely finished. You know, it's, it's there and then it's, it's shot and then the, uh, the editor is working on it and you just get to a point where you decide to stop now. You know, and like, this is what we're doing. But then the audience has their own experience of it. And that's as a crucial a, a part of the 
of the experience as any other. And uh, to, to presume that any one person knows what's right about it is a, um, is a thing I think a lot of, you know, uh, of um, visual artists, uh, painters would have a problem with because uh, uh, my, my, my late spouse was a painter and he said that, um, you know, he said, it's never finished. You just get to a point where you stop and uh, you, <laughs> and you move on to the next thing. You know, the, the energy moves elsewhere. And I do think that there's something about going back and looking at something over and over again that kind of becomes a little bit of navel gazing. You know, like I, I work on shows and people are like, oh, you know, what's your favorite show? And I'm like, well, whichever one I'm working on because yeah. I'm, always, I'm always moving yeah. forward. I'm not, I'm not thinking about like, how would I have done an episode of the OC different? You know, I, no, I, you I'm, go not, crazy. I'm not looking back. Yeah, I'm not looking back yeah. at that. that they're, they're like little boats. You finish them, you set them off to sell, and then you move on. You know? Yeah. So. Is it hard for you to watch like normal TV? Like, be, like I'm saying with the editing background, cause I f find myself like, and I don't have an editing background, but when you watch a movie and you're like, why is it, why'd they stop right there? Or you well, have like, thing, uh, like weird, odd cuts, jump cuts. I, I don't think that if I'm really caught up in the story and if I feel like the story is working on an emotional level, then I'm not thinking about it. But if, it, That's if it's true. not, if it's not working well for some other reason, if the story is just not working well, then I become very aware of what's not working about it. And I can certainly, I can certainly see when something's troubled, you know, I can certainly look at something and go like, Oh yeah, I can see why that was a problem. You know, um, I think that, um, I, I can, I'll sometimes be pulled out because I'll see that they were trying to solve something, you know, like they suddenly are cutting to other people and adding a bunch of ADR dialogue in and oh, yeah. you know, on lines where, you know, I would, I would think that you would want to be on the person speaking and uh, that kind of thing makes me come out of my skin a little bit. Is I also that like think poor that planning or. Well, I, again, no, not necessarily. I think sometimes you yeah. just think certain things are going to play and then you look at it and you go like, Oh, wow, it's a little hard to understand what's going on there. So maybe we need to explain that a little bit. Yeah. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, the, the, um, I just was recently watching, um, uh, an Ilya Kazan film, Splendor in the Grass with, um, Warren Beatty and Natalie Wood from okay. 1962. Cause it's a film I really liked very, very much. Hadn't seen it in years and years. And, uh, I happen to have a copy of the script. And so I was watching it again after not seeing it for, you know, probably 15 years or so. And um, I um, became very aware that like, oh, those lines are ADR. And oh, they're ADR and they're not very good ADR. And how, how what weird placement. And so I went back and I read the script and sure enough, those lines weren't in there. There was just the description of certain moments that I think they hoped would make sense. And I'm sure what happened is they previewed the film and audiences were confused about what's going on, you know, what's yeah. happening. And so is that a failure of planning? Well, on some level, I guess it's a failure of, um, of, of deciding what are the crucial elements that you would need to shoot to make sure that it makes sense to people, but they didn't want to go back and reshoot at that point. So they added dialogue. That's very evident, very evident that it's ADR, yeah. you know, it means it's mixed different. It's, it doesn't sound particularly organic. Um, and there are lines that, you know, I'm looking at and thinking, you don't need these lines at all, <laughs> yeah. you know, but clearly somebody thought they needed them. So, you know, it's a, it's an interesting process. Um, you know, we're, editing has its own weird alchemy and, and sometimes you just don't know until you get in there. You just don't know. Yeah. And, and so one of the reasons why one thing, one of the reasons I, I, I'm a producing director on a show now for Netflix. And I tell all of our visiting directors, we don't do oneers on our show. You you can do you can do a oneer, and you can try to use it, but we have to have coverage on it as, as well of some sort, even if it's just a closer. You know, like I tell them, I say, if you want to do a big steady cam shot, do it, but give me another one on a tighter lens that I can cut into the middle of it if I need to, because you never oh, know. Oh, so you don't let people do one shot. Hmm. There has to be another. Oh, okay. We, they they're not allowed to do oneers on our show. I mean, they're allowed to. They're allowed to do a one on our show and put it into their cut. But you never know for sure. 
until you get into the editing room what the pacing is going to be. You, you think you know, but you very rarely do. So you always want to protect yourself. At least I always want to protect myself, and yeah. I want the people who are working on shows under my auspices to protect themselves. Because I see a lot of directors nowadays trying to be really um, um, impressive with their camera movement, and they want to do a big, complicated one -er. Which, yeah, yeah, it's fun. Everybody would like to do that and see if they can do it. But there's yeah. a reason why Alfred Hitchcock only did it once. You know, there's a reason why he was like, and you know, it didn't work. You know, <laughs> yeah. because we're basically violating the, the very idea of montage, which is to follow, follow the psychological line of a, of a, a story uh, by the way something is edited and by the way something is... Um, is, is juxtaposed against something else. You juxtapose this image against this image and it creates a third effect. You know, that's the, 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 the beauty of editing. And what you do oftentimes, you know, like, what was that movie that Michael Keaton was in, Birdman? Uh, Birdman, oh, yeah. there's just a lot of times in Birdman, I sat there and I thought, yeah, it's very impressive that they were able to accomplish this. And there are a lot of times where I would like to be on the other character now. You know, yeah. like I... Felt the same thing about 1917. I felt like, okay, yeah, it's cool. It's cool. It's a stunt, but it's not involving as a film. It doesn't involve me. It doesn't. It doesn't speak to my particular uh, emotional experience in a film to see an entire film that's just one take. I'm just, you know, to me, that's 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 it, it's basically not using one of the primary tools you have to use as a filmmaker to make people understand the psychological line of a story. So, yeah. Well, so Netflix, is that something you're working on right now? Yeah, I'm a producing director on a show called Sweet Magnolias. That's uh, we just finished our oh. third season. Yeah, so uh, we we just we just wrapped our third season a couple of months ago. Um, Congrats! That's like a big hit. It is a big hit, and uh, very hopeful we'll get a fourth season. But we'll see. Um, I am um, very grateful to have worked on it. I shot the pilot and have uh, directed. Uh, 14 episodes over the three seasons. So wow. uh, um, it's it's a real labor of love for me. And then the other show I'm doing right now on a regular basis, well, not on a regular basis, I've done two of them. I did one last season, I did one this season, is uh, NCIS Hawaii. So cool. I uh, went right from uh, Sweet Magnolias to Hawaii for one episode of that. And uh, really, in great, I was grateful that uh, they invited <laughs> me back to do that show because that show was kind of like a – Paid vacation, so yeah, yeah. So. What is it like when you're like a director for a, like how long are you there for like a typical show? Just, just under a month. Uh, for the first episode I did, it was a little over a month, and this one was wow. just a little under a month. Um, it's a it's the the job of the way the television directing has evolved is is odd, but it is what it is. And there oftentimes there are a lot of rotating directors in and out, and um, I find that, that is a, that's a fun job. It's really fun to just kind of go in, do your thing, and then leave. Uh, I tend to enjoy the shows a little bit more where I'm very invested and where I, like, have a long history. So, for instance, I did, uh, you know, I worked on the OC from the very, very beginning. I yeah. edited the pilot, and I edited, and I directed uh, second unit on the finale, the series finale. So I worked on it all four seasons. I was there every single day of all four seasons. And then... Um, um, on Gossip Girl, the original Gossip Girl, I directed 12 episodes. And um, on the original Pretty Little Liars, I directed 23 episodes. Oh, so I, I, enjoy, I enjoy those shows where I go in and I really uh, dig in. I feel like a, it's a family. It's a family that I'm very close to. I have a very um, a great shorthand with the cast and the crew. I tend to enjoy those shows, shows more. But I also was, you know, I was really looking forward to going to NCIS Hawaii because it was just like, okay, I'm here. Just tell me, you know, what's the drill? What do you want me to do? You know, what's, what's the job? You know, and, and my job as a visiting director is to come in and look at the show. It's like, okay, this is the way they shoot the show. And I will shoot the show the way they shoot the show. So, for instance, if I worked on a show where they were saying, we do all oneers, I'd be like, okay, let's, let's, we'll figure out how to do all oneers. You know, yeah. um, but my job as a visiting director is to come in, look at the show, see how they shoot it, not try to imprint my stamp and originality on it. Try to find my way of bringing my 
sense of values, my sense of storytelling to the way they shoot the show, but to, sh but to do it in a way that um, uh, is going to fit within their template of how they shoot it. So, for instance, um, on NCIS Hawaii, I shoot a lot more coverage than I ordinarily would on my own show. You know, like uh, on my own yeah. show, I don't, I don't ever go into big, tight close-ups unless it's a big emotional moment. Um, but that's not the way they do it on that show, and so I will do it the way they do it. You know, like yeah. my job. Well, you got those one-liners. You got to get those one-liners one just before the commercial break. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the, the important thing for me is that I am a guest. I always say when I'm working on a show where I'm a visiting director, I always say I'm double parked. You know, my car is running <laughs> in the parking lot, and uh, I, I I am there at the I am there at the um, pleasure of those people for whom I'm working, and so I want to make sure that I give them a product that fits within what they do, but that they like, that they look at and they go like, yeah, we like it, you know? So I was very pleased when they invited me back for season two, because um, I really enjoyed working on the show in season one. And uh, it was fun. It was fun to do something different after doing three seasons of a show where, you know, I'm, I'm involved in every single decision that's yeah. made from casting to music to, to the editing, you know, uh, I work with the the showrunner very closely and the other producers on the show, and we we all work very very much about you know exactly what we want the show to be and wh how we want it to look and how we want it to feel, and and that's that's a lot of work, you know, it's a lot of work, and so it was kind of fun to you know finish the third season and then jet off to Hawaii and yeah. just be like. Hey, this is great. Now I'm going to go walk on the beach before I go home. <laughs> but it's got a, it's super grueling, like right. For, if that show shoots, if you were there for a month for one episode, well, that's why. Is that all, why TV shows? Oh, not all of them are like that. Okay. Well, no, that's that's pretty much the, the schedule. But uh, sometimes even longer if you're doing two episodes at once, because a lot of people oh, are okay. shooting these days. But uh, the. Um, you know, that's not all shooting. That's prepping. You're there prepping, yeah. you're location scouting, you're doing all of that. Then you're generally shooting like eight or nine days or 14 or 15 days if you're shooting a block of episodes, meaning two episodes at once. Um, so, uh, you know, it's it's that's not an unusual schedule. That's generally. OK, I no, I was going to say, because mm -hmm. most shows, when you watch them, even like shows like like. Seinfeld, like 30 minutes, you'll see a lot of the same director's names, yeah. but not like the same one back to back to back episodes. I was yeah. thinking, I don't know if that's like a, Hey, it's a grueling process to be a TV director, or we like to switch it up a little vision wise, like having a different director. Well, I think there's some of that that goes on. I think that there's some yeah. people wanting to, you know, not give the uh, directors, um, um, too much of a foothold, you know, so that they can kind of keep the show more the way that they want it to be. Then you see other shows like, you know, Mike White directed all six episodes of White Lotus. Um, no, that's true. Uh, Steven Soderbergh directed all of the episodes of The Nick. You know, you, you're seeing more and more of that, too, where you get, you see these auteurs coming in and writing and directing, you know, the whole thing. Um, but that's that's unusual. You know, that's that's the exception. That's not the rule. The rule is basically you you come in, you do it, and then you move on. So... And when so do I'm you working, write it all, Norman? Do no, you write it all? No, I, I don't. Um, I uh, felt like that um, uh, when I was young, I had uh, aspirations in that direction, but then I never really followed through on that, and I realized that what I'm better at doing, and in many ways, editing is, is essentially rewriting. You know, you're basically going in and, and, and doing the final rewrite on the script in many ways. Um, and so, you know, that just was my career path. My career path took me in that direction, you know, where I was focused mostly on editing and then directing. And um, I have tried to write a couple of times. I did write a script that um, was, uh, I was trying to get off the ground as a feature several years ago, but after my spouse died, I kind of lost the rhythm for I'm it. Sure. You know, yeah, it just was like, it was like, all right. That was then and now is now. And, you know, I was just happy to be working. And uh, yeah, yeah, at this now. point, you know, I'm, I'm pretty happy with what I'm doing. I'm pretty happy working in a situation where, you know, other people are doing that heavy lifting and, and my skill set is something different. It's so crazy. You're going to school for history and your mom changed it. And then years later, you're 
making every decision on with other people, like on Sweet Magnolias, like on a show like that. It's pretty wild. Yeah, well, it's uh, it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting uh, place for my uh, career to have come to. Um, that show in particular, just by virtue of the fact that I really relate to the show because I grew up around these kinds of people. The Sweet Magnolias is about a small southern town in South Carolina, but it could just as easily be about a town in Texas. You know, it's yeah. it's very um, much just about community. And, you know, so at this point in my life to also be returning to where I grew up, it's curious. It's a curious uh <laughs> It's a curious journey. So. <laughs> so what? So over the years, like when you're starting out, like Tender Mercies, I always like to ask this question to folks: Did you ever like keep mementos over the years? Do you have like shooting scripts or anything from like Tender Mercies or any of the earlier films you worked yeah, on? Yeah, yeah, I do. I mean, I I don't know what I'll do with them eventually. Probably you know, <laughs> they'll, they'll pass away, and my niece will throw them all out or something. But uh. You know, yeah, no, I, mean, I do have a lot of that stuff. I, I've thought about uh, categorizing it and, you know, figuring out, like, you know, there are these various um, archives at various universities that really hunger to get their hands on a lot of that kind of stuff. So USC, um, give something back. Yes, I could. I, you know, it's funny. I went to USC, and then I've the past several years I've taught at UCLA. Oh, so, cool. So um, I um, – uh, you know, my, Rivals. my, my yeah. allegiance is split, you know, because uh, <laughs> I started teaching at UCLA in around 2004, and then I stopped teaching there for a long time, and then they asked me to start teaching there again. Uh, um, I'm going to take a break now from teaching, but I taught there this last spring. It's the last time I was in L.A., actually. And um, I do enjoy teaching. I do enjoy that process of um kind of passing on what I know, because I do feel that, uh, I mean, it's another reason I like to do these podcasts is just to talk about the things that are important to me. Yeah. Because I do feel like that a lot of this, um, this, well, I, I feel like a lot of the apprenticeship process has gotten lost in the business. Is that even it a used, thing anymore? Well, not in the way that it once was. Uh, I, like I say, when I worked on Tinder Mercies and when I worked on Silkwood and when I worked on Places in the Heart, I was right next to those editors and I was, talking to them about their choices and I was involved in their in their thinking process because I was you know as Bill Anderson was working on the movie oh on Tinder Mercies I was standing there you know handing him actual pieces of film I was handing him trims now the assistants work in a different room and they're digitizing and there's no there's none of that kind of cross-pollination the way there once was unless the editor really makes an effort to do that with his assistants and um his or her assistants and uh I do think it's a very important thing. It's, I was very fortunate that I had that training, that I had the training that I did, because that I don't see that happening a lot. And I do think I learned certain things back then that are, you know, there's certain things that are, I mean, I see a lot of, you were asking about, do I bump on things when I'm watching TV? And not exactly, but I do see a lot of lazy editing. I see a lot of what I call lazy editing. I mean, I can look at what's on the screen and just go like, eh, that could have been, put together much better and it's just not lazy sound editing, you know, yeah. where you hear people's lips smacking all the time, drives me nuts. And I'm, you know, like I've probably, you know, like the various editors that have trained under me, I've made them just as, just as anal about it because it's just, you know, when, when you and I are talking right now, it's very rare. You hear either one of us going. Yeah. Yeah. But, but you have actors out there under hot lights and they're nervous and they're trying to remember lines and their, their mouths are dry from, from a certain amount of just uh, performance anxiety, uh, you know, there's a lot of lip smacking that goes on and it really drives me crazy when I watch a TV show and just hear that going. I also don't like exasperated exhalations before a line, you know, an actor will go and then they'll say their line, you know, and a lot of that stuff is, is left in and, and, you know, that's an actor trying to remember what they're supposed to say next. That's a tell. You know, yeah. that's basically an actor kind of like, I don't know what I'm supposed to say next, so I need to take a minute and think about it, so I'll take a deep breath and exhale. So I call them exasperated exhalations, and I think they're very, um, they're, 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 they're lethal to the dramatic movement of a scene, you know. So I'm, I'm quite, uh, I'm quite uh, hard on editors sometimes. I'm like, yeah. get rid of that, get rid of that exhalation before that line, or, you know, yeah. take out the audio of it at least, you know, if you want the beat before the line, take out the audience, the audio, because it just feels like a, 
an air balloon. It just feels like the air is going out of the balloon when, um, when um, you hear a big exhalation in the middle of a scene. And, and that was stuff I learned early on from some of these, these um, great editors and sound editors and music editors that I worked with uh, back in New York in my New York days. I mean, these, these were people who were at the top of their craft and they taught me and they were diligent in the teaching and hard about it, you know, kind of like, no, this is important. And um, I, I really feel like that I was lucky that I grew up in a time and worked in a time when, when the apprenticeship process was, was just that. It was an apprenticeship process. You really learned. I learned under some of the best people. And, um, and I, so I do, you know, I, I do like teaching and I do enjoy doing it because I feel like that there's a real opportunity to, to hopefully get back, you know? Yeah, no, it seemed, I don't know when that, where that broke, but it's funny. I interviewed like a couple of people that this guy, Ron Schmidt, who was a cinematographer, he worked on mm -hmm. like the shield, the mists, mm -hmm. and he his apprentice was a guy I interviewed like two weeks before this guy, Steven poster. And it was mm -hmm. so funny. He goes, yeah, he goes, I know, I know him because when I was at film school in LA, they basically were like, okay, you're going with you. You're going with so-and-so. So, -and -so. so you, they would let you go on set for like a week and they mm -hmm. like formed this bond. So they were able to learn. And that's the only mm -hmm. way you learn is actually mm -hmm. talking to somebody that's been doing something. Like when you're in a classroom, you can learn like the building blocks when you're in a job. That's when you actually, yeah. You know, when you're cutting your teeth doing it is when you actually figure out, okay, this is what it really is. Yeah. And uh, I, I can tell you when it got lost in the editing business was, you know, when things went digital because yeah. the, the uh, particularly early on, because it used to be really hard to even get and, and to be able to get a second avid for your assistant was a big, was, was a big ticket item on a budget. And so the uh, assistants would oftentimes have to work in off hours, you know, as to when the editors were working. And so you you didn't have that person right there next to you in the same way you did back in the day. Um, so I, I definitely think that when when the assistants started working in a different room, because as I said, you know, my, my training was I was right there. I was right there next yeah. to the editors. I was right in the room with them. I was the one that was making sure they had what they needed and, and um they would talk about their process as they were doing it, you know. Do you think so, it got to the point because digital, they didn't need like some people on set and they would just be like, hey, we'll send you the files and you can work on it? Well, I don't think it's something that's that simple as like, well, this is when it happened and how it happened as much as yeah, yeah, just, yeah, no, no. As, as the technology has changed, that, that kind of labor intensive part of it. Look, in some ways, I wish I'd grown up in the digital age because I spent years of my life reconstituting trims, you know, and <laughs> and uh, that, that's time I'll never get back. So there's part of me that feels like, well, it's a trade off because there's other things that you would have now that you didn't back then. But I don't think, you know, what they don't teach a lot on the job and what they quite frankly, they don't teach a lot in the film schools, I don't think, um, is an aesthetic. You know, like yeah, to really train somebody to think about why they're doing something. I mean, I think editing is very psychological and I think every cut should have a psychological meaning. I just, I'm not, you know, I, I get very impatient when I have an editor and I ask them, well, why'd you cut here now? And they're just, well, I just felt like it was time to cut. That's not a reason to cut. That's, yeah, not, yeah, a, yeah. that's not a good cut. A, 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 a cut that ha means something, a cut that has meaning behind it. And the problem I have with a lot of directing in television is that there's a lot of directors who just come in and they just shoot a bunch of shit. You know, they're just, um, as, as a director friend of mine said, they're just collecting shots. You know, they're not thinking about in terms of, well, how's this uh, going together? How's this being built? How is this being built? And what is the story that's being told by how it's being built? And where are we shifting the point of view at this point? You know, by, by making this cut, in what way are we telling the story? In what way are we subjective in what way are we objective you know what way are we are we really leading the audience on a journey of psychological pro progression and um so many of the editors that are working nowadays i mean thought about these things you know, let alone you know like really um explored their own um 
interest in what story they want to tell. You know, they're just cutting together a bunch of shots. And so, you know, for me, like I say, I always warn editors, I'm like, you're going to be working, so just count on it. You know, don't take it personally. You're just going to, you're going to be working. And, and, and not because I want to create work for anybody, but it's because I really want them to think about, like, what does this cut mean? Why are we cutting here now? What is, what is the benefit of it? In what way do we get something more? You look at a film like, um, the, my favorite film of the year so far is uh, Tar. And uh, you look at a film like Tar, I mean, there's not a cut in that movie that doesn't have a meaning. And there's not a moment in it where, you know, he didn't know exactly why he was cutting and to what purpose, you know. And there's a lot of scenes where he lets things play out in big wide shots. And there's other places where he cuts in to, to um, um, coverage. And, but every single moment in that film has psychological import. And I think that that's... Um, that's the goal. Now, granted, on TV schedule, you're not going to be able to make a movie, but you you can at least get it in the ballpark of making the cuts mean something. Um, uh, there's a quote. There's a it's an Alfred um, Hitchcock quote, and I'm looking over at this bag on my doorknob here because uh, uh, Jason Antoon, who's one of the actors on NCIS Y, he was shadowing me on my episode and. And he knew I was a big Alfred Hitchcock fan, so he gave me this bag with this quote by oh, Alfred Hitchcock cool. that says, uh, the quote is, the screen rectangle must be charged with emotion. And I, I really do believe that that's the goal, that every, every moment that you're, that you're looking, it, you know, the, the plot is the plot, and sometimes you know what the plot is, and sometimes it doesn't really matter what the plot is, because what you're really going for is more of an experience. And um, so what I'm always looking is, is how to tell an emotional story. And so I'm always looking for the opportunity to put the camera in such a place that I'm going to get the most emotional charge, the most emotional bang for my buck out of where the camera is placed relative to the story that's being told. And the thing that frustrates me, that's why I say I don't go into this type of big yeah. close-up unless it's a big emotional moment because once you get into this, you have no place else to go. So <laughs> yeah, you, you don't, you, there's no other way that you're going to inflect emotion. And so you want to save those shots so that, you know, you're getting the most bang for your buck from your, from your close shots. And that's what we try to do on Sweet Magnolias. You know, we try to try to kind of keep our medium shots for exposition and then our closer shots we're using for our big emotional uh, moments. That's that's definitely the goal we set, and something that we. It's one of the very first things I talked to the showrunner Cheryl Anderson when I first was being interviewed by her for the job. Um, I told her that that's what I would like to do. That that's what I would really um, like to reach for as an aesthetic for the show is that we're trying to tell the story, the emotional story, visually, and that we don't want to feel like that we want to cover every single line of dialogue in a big close shot. You know, and she was very open to that. And she was very, um, she was very uh, uh, not only open to it, but then really embraced that as an aesthetic of her own. And um, that's, that's what we've done all the way through. Um, and it makes a difference. It makes a difference. I've had people say to me, you know, like I watch the show, I'm not quite sure why it affects me the way it does. And I'm like, huh, well, I know. I know why yeah. it does, because yeah. we're tracking a psychological line, even in scenes that are just exposition, you know, we are tracking a psychological line. There's a psychological reason that people are saying what they're saying and how they're saying it. And so we, we are always trying to you know, push for that. That's great. One, the, one of the most interesting things that you've worked on so many cool things TV wise, but like a show like pretty little liars that was super popular. Me and my wife, my wife loved it. And then she got me hooked on it. And then we actually <laughs> saw Lucy Hale Mm -hmm. uh, we were living in Oregon for like a couple of years. She, oh, yeah. I, we didn't know she was a singer and she mm -hmm. sang at this country festival yeah. and mm -hmm. it was crazy. There was like no one around the stage. And I'm like, man, this is like wild. But like with that show, because of how, like, who was a, but like how far in advance did people like get scripts or were you in the dark the whole time? No, I mean, I knew who a was. A, a, the yeah. first day was, was revealed at the end of the, I think it was the, either the second or third season. I can't remember now, but we all knew it was going to be Mona. And yeah. then um, 
So I knew that really early on. And, um, Who's a great actress. She's really good. Yeah, she is. She's terrific. Yeah. Um, um, Janelle Parrish. Um, the, the thing was the show then continued on. And so there became the need to kind of create new mysteries. If you look at that show, all seven seasons, they're basically doing circle eights. You know, we're just oh, like yeah, yeah. circling back over the same territory and stuff. But but there was a need to kind of create a greater mystery um, in order to keep the show running for the seven seasons that it did. Um, that was, um, um, yeah, I, I, I did enough of the episodes that Marlene King, the showrunner on that, she she kind of kept me looped into where, where yeah. things were going. So I, I kind of knew I did. Uh, I think I, you know, I can't remember exactly how many now, but I did a significant, well, I did 23 over the seven seasons. So. Yeah. And then you worked you on know, the other was, ones too. And it, and there was the one that they just did that was more of like a horror movie. It was like a horror show. The one that was on HBO max. I did not have anything to do with that one. That one yeah. was, uh, that's a whole different group of people who worked yeah. on that new one. That, that, that um, is the guy who does Riverdale. So that's a completely different, completely yeah. different group of people. Um, I did a couple of spinoffs. There was a spinoff that was set in New Orleans called Ravenswood. And then there was a spinoff uh, that was actually in Portland called um, uh, oh, really? Perfectionist. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> neither one of those shows went. They both just lasted a season and then they. Yeah. It was just, it's so hard with any show. Like we cover sequels for the most part. It's so hard to do a show when you have that great of a, the cast that was in the original Pretty Little Liars. It's just hard well, sometimes to recreate that. Yes, it is. And, it, and it's a special, um, it's just chemistry. It's a certain chemistry mm -hmm. that certain casts have. I mean, I couldn't even, I couldn't even tell you who's on the new um, Gossip Girl, for example. I, 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 I don't yeah. know. You know, I mean, I don't know because I don't, <laughs> I don't have that sense of, you know, kind of a cultural awareness the way that it did when Blake Lively was doing it, you know, or, or you know, it's a, it's a, um, uh, it's a certain alchemy that makes something break through on a, on a kind of cultural awareness. Now, now granted, too, I'm not of the demographic that's watching that show. <laughs> so it's not like, it's not like I would know necessarily. But I'm just saying that our cultural landscape is changing so quickly, too, even in the 15 years since the original Gossip Girl went on the air, you know, the cultural landscape has changed so much because now so much of it is TikTok and, you know, yeah. who's popular on TikTok and who's popular in ways that I just, I can't keep up with any of it anymore. For a long time, I did. For a long time, I was very, I was very... You were good, um, you are hip, and then it... <laughs> well, for a long time, I was very, um, I would say for a director, for a television director, I was very well-versed in the ways of social media. But hey... I, particularly with the pandemic, my priorities changed, you know, it's just yeah. like, eh, you know, I'm not going to spend, you know, three fourths of my day on Instagram and Twitter. <laughs> and, uh, I, I feel like that, um, the, the nature of my work has changed too. You know, I'm not like, um, I'm not working on shows that are aimed at, um, that, um, that age group, that age group anymore, but it was for a long time. I mean, I have, I have a pretty healthy following on Instagram and Twitter and, most of them were women who were teenage girls at one point. You know, yeah, look those, at those. Yeah, those the were the OC shows. That, those were the shows that I was show. working on. <laughs> but uh, I, you know, I enjoyed that aspect of it. But I also was like, you know, I got to a point where it's like, okay, did that, and uh, you know, now it's different time of life. Yeah. Uh, Two more questions, Norman. This has been great. Another show I just have to just mention because. I think more people need to watch it is in the dark. I know you just directed one episode of that show. Yeah, I was really disappointed. I get to, didn't get to do more. I I would like to have done more. I don't know. You know, I think that my schedule would not have accommodated it, but I'm not even sure, you know, whether or not I would have been on their list to come back. I like that show very much too. Yeah. yeah. I, I particularly liked working with um, the young woman who played the lead, Perry Mapfeld. Yeah. She was, yep. she was, was terrific. And uh, yeah, I directed the third one. I think. I think I. Oh really? Yeah, the third episode out, and uh, you know. So, so that was more like it's women. funny when you watch a show like that, like an evolution of so many shows. You know, after a season, you have to go different directions. But mm -hmm. like, still, probably the third episode, it was more like, "Hey, this is just this drunk girl that you know." There's a, a murder involved, and there's still like a lot of comedy into it. Man, there's some. 
serious episodes. Like, yeah, crazy. Well, it, it just ended. Yeah, it was going there. It was going there because uh, she def- the, the the murder was definitely there, and the yeah the idea that there was this um, this uh, backstory that we didn't know about. But there were definitely there was definitely a lot more humor in yeah. the earlier episodes than. You know, it became a little more grounded as it went on, I felt. So, yeah. Man. This has been great, Norman. And, and yeah. now, like, feature-wise, obviously, you have your niche in directing. Like, why, you know, do anything different? But do you ever, <laughs> like, long to direct a feature? Well, like I said, I thought about it. You know, I was trying to get one off the ground several years ago. I feel like that at this point, I'm very much enjoying the work I'm doing. And yeah. that's about all I can do. And I have other priorities in my life at this point, and so I, I need to kind of just, you know, I never say never to anything, you know, but I'm not, uh, um, I'm not exactly, um, um, I'm not exactly hungering to do something different than I'm doing right now. Oh I'll yeah, put it that way. So. But if you could, if I gave you a blank check, if I was like a studio exec, would be there be like a genre? That you'd want to shoot? Well, I think that uh, I'm always interested in um, uh, drama, you know, really human uh, stories. And those are not the kind of movies that are getting made these days, you know. Yeah. It's kind of like uh, the, the movies that are getting made are romantic comedies and um, uh, action uh, superhero films. Those are the films that yeah. are being made. You know, the, the day of the, the, of the, of the more um, um, character-driven drama you know, have really been circumscribed and they're, they're still out there, but they're, um, they're Phew. yes. And they're in the, the theatrical window for them is, is also not what it once was. People are not going back to the movie theaters except for the big tentpole movies. And, yeah. and you, and you see a lot of these people who are done, but a lot of these films that are done by very established directors who, who, uh, their films are just falling flat at the box office. Yeah. And, what's um, his name's, uh, the, the, Oh, what the heck movie was it with uh, Matt Matt Damon and Ben Ben Affleck? The one that was set in who the heck directed that? Oh, Ridley Scott. It was Ridley about Scott. like a sword mm-hmm. fight, mm-hmm. and that yeah. movie had like no press, mm-hmm. no commercials, and I think it was in and out of the box office within a month. Yeah, I, can't, I, 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 quite, I, I quite like that movie, and I thought to myself, like, oh, I wonder why there, you know, nobody had the imagination to sell this. Yeah, um, there was a, there was another Ridley Scott movie that was happening right at the same time. I can't remember. Um, I know that there was another one that was oh House of Gucci. House of Gucci was happening right at the same time. Oh yeah, that was more sensational, and that had Lady Gaga, and that had you yeah. know like. But like I say, the cultural landscape has changed so much just since I've been doing it. Just since I've been directing, the cultural landscape has changed so much, and I, I find myself far less compelled by what's happening in movie theaters and even sh- even feature length films. Like I said, I love tar. I thought tar was fantastic. It's almost three hours and uh, you really have to be willing to kind of go on that journey with that director for that, for that ride. But that's my kind of film. Um, the, the, the things that are really compelling me more these days are, are long form television, uh, like limited series, like uh, oh, yeah. Lotus. White Lotus is a great example of some something that feels very much like a feature film, only long, and but does feel like a singular vision of someone. Or The Dropout, I thought was a wonderful show, the one about Elizabeth Holmes with um, Oh yeah, Amanda uh, yeah. Seyfried, and um, um, I like the know, pill the, one too with uh, Michael Keaton. Uh, yes, uh, Dope, Dope Sick. Sick. Yeah, I like and that I think one. That that's, really... that's that's what's really replaced the kind of film going experience that that i grew up with that i really responded to that i really reacted to a film like tender mercies a film like silkwood a film like places in the heart those films couldn't get made today yeah you know, well i think you said it, you hit that nail on the head when it came to like social media and stuff i think it's mm. it's attention span mm. and yeah. the fact that people can change what they watch like when i was a kid if we rented went to the movies the video store and rented like five movies Mm-hmm. Or even we were in one movie. If the movie stunk, you mm-hmm. were going to watch the movie because that's that's the movie that you got for the night. Now there's yeah. like millions of options at your fingertips and you don't have to like stick around to finish something. Some yeah. mm-hmm. quick yeah, cuts, you're, man. You're absolutely Superhero right. Superhero movies. 
Yeah, you're absolutely right about that. And I think that, you know, I'm just glad that I grew up in a time when I did because I really enjoyed the aesthetic of cinema and that that has been lost. Like I said, you know, the only person who's really doing what I really like about movies is at this moment uh, is Todd Field, you know. Yeah. And, uh, I really um, think that, um, you know, I've watched that film three times just because it feels like, well, there's more to mine here. There's more to get at. There's more to understand. There's more to... There's more to examine just from a filmmaking point of view. And uh, I just think that um, it's a brilliant, brilliant film. And so, you know, uh, look, I'm like I say, I'm, I'm, I would never say no to any any direction that life took me. But I have a very comfortable life. I have a, yeah. a very I enjoy the amount of work I've been doing the past, it's, particularly the past couple of years. I've been working about, um, um, you know, seven or eight months on and then several months off. And that's been really nice. nice for me, particularly, you know, particularly I've had some family obligations uh, yeah. that, that, that have really kind of, you earned it for, yeah. You know? And I, and I really just feel like that uh, I, I want to stay, I want to stay engaged in the support of others more than anything else. That to me is what's more important. I have nothing to prove about my own, career at this point. I'm very happy with the career I've had and I'm very, you know, satisfied with it. But I would like to really do what I can to support the movement of others and to, to see some other people have the opportunities that I did. And so that's why I think a lot more about teaching. It's one of the yeah. reasons, as I said, it's one of the reasons I I, am, I like to do these podcasts. Um, I do really want to try to um, um, bring other people along in their experience and the more and more I can do that, then I'll feel really good about that. So. Yeah. And I love, I love looking at like just where you went to. It's like, everybody has like a starting point. Like you mentioned the corner movies, but like silent night, deadly night five. And <laughs> we just covered that. And I interviewed Brian used who just like produced and wrote like story. Oh, and Brian. Yeah. Brian was a definitely, guy. definitely wrote some of the script because there's a line in the movie when the little girl sitting on Santa's lap, she asked for a VHS copy of bride of reanimator. Which yeah, is definitely yeah. him uh, putting that in there. But you worked some other ones that aren't on you. Didn't you work on like Lethal Weapon Three as an assistant editor? Yeah, yeah, I did. Uh -huh. Yeah, I worked on Lethal Weapon Three. I worked on uh, my favorite horror movie of the horror movies I did was I worked with Don Coscarelli on Phantasm Three, and nice. uh, Don is a wonderful friend, and he's a he's a great guy, and he's somebody you should get on your podcast sometime. Yeah, I'll reach out and to talk him. to him. Yeah, because he is he was just. I loved working with that guy, and I, I recently did the the DVD commentary nice. for Phantasm Three with him. You know, he and I just like sat there and talked about the. You know, uh, it's been four or five years ago that we did this now, but we just sat around one afternoon and watched the movie and talked about it and and uh, re everything we could remember about it, and it was just a blast. But he has remained a really close good friend and. Um, was somebody that I truly enjoyed working with. But, um, uh, yeah, Brian, I, I pitched a film to Brian. I had this idea of a horror movie I wanted to do, to, and uh, he was very nice. He listened to me, but never went anywhere. So I guess it wasn't that good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. He was definitely interested. I like Brian. Yeah, terrific guy. So Thank you, Norman. This has been great, man. Yeah, I'm glad we yeah. connect. I'm glad I learned about editing and uh, yeah, yeah. talk about, man, just that's so cool yeah. that your mom – Push you in that direction. Maybe if your maybe if your sister didn't work out, maybe she would have been like Norman. You know, it could be a history major. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I I just feel like you know you're going to go where you're going to go. The the, yeah. the, the 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 acorn is going to drop off the, the tree. You know, so uh, <laughs> I just uh, you know I had the career I was supposed to have. But uh, I've enjoyed talking to you. So I hope it gives you everything you want. And if you have oh, any further questions, yeah. let me know. 